I'm really sorry, Marta, but I think you would die first. Yeah, I feel like Marta would just forget her keys and get <laughs> eaten by the zombie. You don't know me. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> Don't say that. I do not involve I myself don't. in this chaotic energy. <laughs> <laughs> I disassociate myself. Welcome to the Feeder Series podcast. A lot of Feeder Series championships started over the last few weeks, which, of course, is great for us at Feeder Series. But in today's episode, we're going to be talking about the one and only with F1 in its name. I'm your host, Jim Kimberley, and it's all about the much-discussed F1 Academy, who started their championship at my favourite track in the world, the Red Bull Ring. And I suspect I might not be the only person who now holds this iconic Austrian circuit in high regard as I'm joined by three drivers who each enjoyed F1's Academy season opening race at the Spielberg track. First up, let me introduce and get this for an introduction, the first ever championship leader and already a two-time winner in the new series. Welcome back to the podcast, Marta Garcia. How does championship leader sound as an introduction? Thank you. Thank you for having us here. Uh, well, it's amazing to be obviously the first woman to win both races. Um, one of them. Oh, well, yeah, both races, race one and race three. And I'm really happy with it. Um, of course, uh, we still have to work a lot um, for the championship, but it's a good start. And I'm really happy with it. So, yeah, it's uh, it's amazing. And um, I'm looking forward for the next race in Valencia, which is this weekend which is my home race. So let's see how it goes there. All kicking off, isn't it? It's really, really coming thick and fast now. Joining Marta today are her Prima teammates who also made their mark in the new championship. Hello and welcome to the podcast for the first time, Bianca Bustamante. Silverware already. Have you found a home for your new trophy? Um, yeah, so it's my first ever podium uh, in my Formula car career. Uh, I wasn't really expecting that for the inaugural race of F1 Academy, you know, because it was a new championship, new track for me, and like um, for, for a lot of the drivers. So yeah, I wasn't expecting that. But in the end, we showed the pace. Uh, we were we qualified P2 for both Q1 and Q2. Uh, unfortunate with race three, but really started off really well. The whole team, you know, the whole Prima team. And I know for the next few races, we'll be showing really strong things. Very PR, Bianca. It must be a press officer's dream with that sort of answer. But last, <laughs> but very much not least of the trio here is a driver who can boast that they scored a top 10 finish in their very first race driving a single-seater car in tricky conditions as well. Welcome to the podcast. Clu Chong, quite a debut result. You must be pretty happy with that. Yeah, I mean... In some ways, I'm really happy. In some ways, I'm a bit disappointed because I think we could have had a bit more. We had a bit of a, a mess of a qualifying, didn't even get a lap in Q2, but it is what it is. And we started a bit far back from where we probably should have been in the race one. And we came through to P6. And so it was a good result. I was happy with that for my first race. But again, there's something in my mind that tells me that we could have had more. So um, yeah, a good race, but a bit disappointed in some ways. <laughs> Racing drivers are never happy, I understand. I'm sure Marta wishes she won all three, so you're never going to be quite happy, but very impressed with you nonetheless. Before we get started, if you enjoy the podcast, please like, comment, and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, or leave a rating or review if you're listening on Spotify or another podcast platform. And if you happen to be listening on Spotify or watching on YouTube, you can take part in our podcast polls. Last time out, we asked, who do you think would win the Frecker Championship in 2023? And perhaps you all knew we'd have Prima drivers joining us this week, or maybe this driver is just that highly rated, but Andrea Kimi Antonelli was the victor. He picked up 50% of the Spotify votes and a whopping 77% of YouTubes. Perhaps it'll be a Prima double, as this week I'm gonna ask you, who do you think will be crowned the first F1 Academy champion? You can check the YouTube channel or scroll down on Spotify to cast your vote now, and I'll read out the results on the next episode. While you're there, if you haven't already rated or subscribed, please take 10 seconds to do so. It really does help us out. 
Okay, so we of course are going to go into all the details of Spielberg, but let's get the W-shaped elephant out of the way first, if we can. Marta and Bianca, you both had your seasons cut short last year after a trip to Singapore with W Series. Now you find yourself in F1 Academy. Marta first, how much change have you gone through since October and now? And how different have you found F1 Academy, two W Series, both the car, both the format? coverage, etc. Well, I think to be fair, like um, it's quite different, both uh, both things like W Series, we raced there. I raced there for three years. It was a different car from an original. And also like the organization was totally different. Um, so yeah, obviously there's a big difference in that sense. Um, now with the F1 Academy, of course, it's different cars. We have Formula 4 cars, which is like uh, a bit less power than the Formula Regional. Uh, but it's totally different in terms of organization as it's like private teams. So obviously with Prima and I really enjoy working with them because they are quite professional. Um, for me, it's like something even new because I never really got to go with a private team anywhere in any other championship in single seaters. One second, Martin, because you say professional, but I've seen a video of you and a certain Daniel Kvyat, which wasn't all so professional with some of the <laughs> dancing yeah. that was going on. I think everyone was delighted seeing that. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's um something fun to see for fans, of course. Um, but yeah, it was it was quite fun that day. Uh, actually, that that's the first day that I met Danny. So, <laughs> what a relationship start! Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but yeah, as as I said, like it's totally different now. It's different if one academy, private teams, a four car, um, and yeah, just like working from here as a start. Let's say I'm like starting again, and then see see how it goes. Same question to you, Bianca, but I'm particularly interested in hearing about how much the Indian Racing League and the F4 UAE has helped you from, I'll kind of have to say it to be frank, but a low scoring W Series 2022, but go straight into a podium in the opening round. So how much has changed for you in the last six months? Uh, yeah, the last six months for me has been a really of a roller coaster ride. Um, as, as many of you know, and like you said, you know, W Series wasn't the strongest season for me because I went straight from karting and straight into a regional car. So that itself made it so much more tough. And like what Marta said, I think, you know, W Series and F1 Academy both have the same vision, but different execution um, racing wise. Um, and for me, as someone that's stepping up from karting to Formula cars, it, it was very difficult. Um, hence why it was hard for me to actually produce, um, you know, any good races or results. Um, and the limited track time made the situation a lot more difficult. So, you know, coming into the next year, all we were thinking about is getting the most track time we can, because in our junior formula years, this is the most time where we actually spend a lot of time testing. Like you don't get this much testing when you go up the ladders in F3, F2 because of the testing ban and everything. So I knew that to be able to grow and, you know, to show result, I needed any track time I could get and hence why we did IRL we were able to secure a seat enough for UAE um you know working with Prama and everything and I think that was a pivotal moment of, of my career I would say was actually getting you know um the, the chance to work with Prema with such a high efficient and professional team I was able to work on my craft my driving my technique on track and off track and learn every good habits I can and I think um for UAE was a good platform for me to learn with the best drivers. You know, I was teammates with drivers like Ugo, James, Tuka, and I could really just see the, the 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 competitiveness that they were showing. And I knew that for me to be able to excel, I needed to be at least on that level. And at some point, you know, we were there. We were in P6, we were P7. Um, we even scored some points in in um, F4 UAE. So I think that set me off in a really good um, trajectory going into F1 Academy with my, a lot of um, the track time I was able to get, I knew that it was all about execution now and coming into the first weekend. Um, I wasn't expecting, like I said, a P2, but in the end, all of our hard work off season really showed. I'm so happy for you. And I'm <laughs> sure Chloe's going to be happy because I'm going to say that's enough from the W Series side of things right now. So let's talk about <laughs> the present and let's talk about the future. So thank you for your patience, Chloe. A couple of questions for you. So firstly, how did you hear about F1 Academy and what was the process for joining like for you? So I think I heard about F1 Academy maybe 
I think I pretty heard about it first when they announced it at Abu Dhabi with the mm. F1. And I initially thought like this would be a great idea if I could get into this, but I think you know they, they're gonna try to choose some more experienced drivers first. And so we played the waiting game and February came around and we we got a call mid-February from mm. from Prema and yeah, I kind of just went from there. <laughs> so you just sit sit back and wait for them to come to you. That's quite a method. Well, but we, we didn't really expect to, to, to get a seat this year. It was more like we had already prepared to do the British Kart Championship this year. We'd done some races. We'd done a lot of tests. We even bought a new chassis for the championship. And then suddenly we got a call. So we, we didn't expect a call, but um, surprisingly we got a call. And I'm really happy to, to take on this opportunity. And I, I never expected it. So it was a nice surprise. And your birthday just must have hit around the right time, right? Because you turned 16 about yeah, just over yeah. a month ago, is that right? Yeah, I wouldn't have been able to get my license before wow. 16. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to, to have my birthday right before the start <laughs> of the season. And, yeah, I'm the youngest driver and, and it gives me a lot of time to develop, especially with the, the series, you know, giving us a lot of track time and, and a lot of development with Prema themselves. So... Well, speak of the track time for a second, Chloe. So how much time have you spent in the cars in the wet? Because it must have been a bit of a baptism of fire. I think I said on my story, it was um, a, like a christening of a fire because we we'd spent the whole two days in the dry and then it just suddenly started raining. And I've, I think I've had like maybe five laps maximum in like sort of dampish conditions um, in, in the F4 car. So it was a bit scary and the team just told me to take it slow. Um, unfortunately, on my fastest lap, which was, I think the Delta was like maybe a top five. And in the last corner, I just, I got too excited because I knew it was a good lap and a rookie mistake happened. And that was that. So um, a bit disappointing, but at least we know that we have pace right off the start in my first experiences in the wet. So um, that's more than the team could ask for. That's more than what I could ask for. So I'm really happy with that. Hey, Chloe, if you're on for a top five with one corner to go in your first wet race, that's not a bad way to start. On qualifying, though, Marta, you grabbed two front rows on merit and they became pole positions because of Carlin disqualifications. You've obviously raced Abby for a few years. How much of a race do you think she would have given if she was alongside you on the front row for race one and two, uh, one of three it was, wasn't it? Well, I don't really know because it didn't happen. But to be fair, I think it will happen being a good fight for sure. Um, but yeah, for us, like the race was really good. Um, obviously, with the disqualification, um, we started on pole and then we went from pole. We had a an OK start um, on race one, um, even though I got overtaken like in third corner, I think. And I was like, no, I need to overtake. So I were to go on turn four after um, to, to Nerea, I think it was, yeah. Um, and yeah, it was a it was um a bit also tension on the last race because I got a problem on my limiter and it got stuck. And I remember like Hamda was like like a three second gap and then she was like almost like there with me, like one one second gap. Um so yeah, it was a bit tension, like scary that moment when where I got my limiter stuck. Um but yeah, it was really good. Like with the two good races, um starting from pole. Obviously, it helps as well in a track that is difficult to overtake. Um, and also, if you defend quite okay, it's also not easy that they overtake you. So I did quite well on the on the last race. And yeah, I'm quite happy with, with the work that we've done all over the weekend. Yeah, I've not actually done any racing myself, but I've heard starting from pole position is usually quite helpful. <laughs> so if you keep that up, Marta, you'll be looking really well. Bianca, you obviously did well as well. I know you had a bit of a... Uh, ending to the weekend you would have preferred not yeah. to have but based on the time you did spend on track who do you think your main rivals will be based on this opening round <laughs> that's kind of funny um yeah most of the drivers that are, are um within the top top five top eight are drivers i've raced with a lot already uh, with hamda i've raced with her quite a lot enough for uae and she's a very clean driver um very quick Unfortunate, you know, with her um, incident in the last last round of for UAE, she had a bit of um, an injury, and I know that she's going to bounce back a strong, a, a lot stronger. And she has, you know, she went from you know in Barcelona for not being able to drive to being really quick. So I know that she's going to be definitely um, a dark horse 
in the competition, you know, as well as Marta, very experienced driver. Um, she's been in an F4 car uh, since 2016, 2017. So I think um, with a lot of experience that she has, I'm able to learn from it. You know, me and Chloe, um, we're learning a lot from her. Um, and as well as, you know, like you said, Abby, who's uh, a very um, experienced driver. She's really quick in the wet, really quick in the dry. So I think she's really consistent. So overall, I think the whole F1 Academy grid is, is has lots of very consistent and lots of potential. So you can never really say who's, you know, who's um, going to be the top contender. But I know that within the grid that we have now, there's a lot of good drivers in it. I cannot wait to get properly dug into the highlights. I know the coverage has been a bit of a contentious issue, but hopefully I can attend some races. Hopefully we can look at some highlights. One final question. I was going to ask all three of you, but I think I'm going to pick on you, I'm afraid, Chloe. Just how do you reflect on the opening weekend? I know, again, it wasn't exactly everything you wanted and you had the weather to contend with. You had all sorts of problems, but it's your first race weekend. So as Bianca said about... W series and going from a car to a car how was it for you yeah so I mean this year we haven't gotten a lot of track time I think we've had four tests before the start of the season and that was it and some other drivers have had like eight nine tests before so it was a bit like we needed to set expectations and I think we wanted initially before the weekend like a 11th or 12th place finish if we could and so there's a lot to take away from the weekend. And for me, it was just getting as much time on track as we can, setting some fast laps and trying to get my head around the racing procedure because it, it was just something new to me. So even if, even though we were quite fast in testing, the racing we knew was going to be quite different. And um, yeah, this weekend we just used to to get used to, to everything, get used to the starts and try to try to find a rhythm with the racing. So I think we've used the weekend well and we've, one got a, a half decent results and and two we've we've reached our goal and we've actually taken aboard some of the information that we found. I'm going to dive in now into the audience questions. I'm sure everyone's had enough of me talking and the podcast after all is for you viewers and listeners. So let's move on to the hashtag AskFS part of the podcast. If this is your first time watching or listening, you can get involved by using the hashtag AskFS on Twitter. You can join our Discord and use a podcast questions channel. You can comment on our YouTube videos and posts, or you can keep an eye out on our Instagram posts and stories. Caveat, there's a lot of questions, and I've got three drivers who are on a time limit here. So I'm not going to get through all of them, but I'll try and get through as many as possible. However, audience, um, I have to say, there's this first question from a previous guest, but it's a little bit different. This is Roman Belinsky of Frecker fame. I'm going to ask a very different question, uh, probably not what you expect and uh, not a racing question at all. But um, if there was a zombie apocalypse, who would survive the longest and um, what car would you use to get around in? That is a question and a half. So to reconfirm... <laughs> If there's a zombie apocalypse happened, if the zombies came and took over Earth, which of you three, and you can debate, we're all sitting next to each other, which of you three would last the longest and which car would you use to escape the zombies? I'm really sorry, Marta, but I think you would die first. Yeah, I feel like Marta would just forget her keys and get <laughs> eaten by the zombie. Or she would just like sleep in too long. Yeah, she'd sleep in too long. And just... Wait, but I don't get it. So is there a zombie apocalypse? Yeah. Who do you think the three of us has the most survival skill? Not for, for sure is it. Marta is not. Why for... not? You don't know me. <laughs> don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> we know you <laughs> well enough. Know. I mean, know you well enough, but she'd forget water. She'd probably lose but what phone. <laughs> so what do we need to do? What do you need to do in an apocalypse? Like, wake up early. You would need wake up early. Yeah, maybe you don't just you don't sleep. Maybe yeah, because you're in apocalypse. <laughs> yeah, probably not me. Maybe <laughs> I'm. I'm not too sure. But if they say so, let's just say like that. No, I'm sure. And then they love you, Marta. I love you. Well, well, we've got, well, let's, I'm, let's I'm let's ruling Marta out. Right? And Marta, I do remember last time you came on that Alice Powell also suggested that you're quite forgetful. So you <laughs> might not do so well. I am, yeah. The I actually have a funny story. Um, so I, I think this is the Singapore Grand Prix. And mm -hmm. I actually lost my AirPods 
So I had the case of it and she lost her case, but she had the AirPods. We just took my case. Yeah. I was so, like, Bianca, can you give me your case? She's like, I lost my AirPods. And she's she's like, like, just well, then her. just give me your case. And then we like, you know, like it's equilibrating. It doesn't sound like a lot of we in that, to be honest, Marta. It sounds like a lot of I. Um, we didn't get an answer to the question though. And I think Marta has to take a step back because you all agree that you're yeah, not going to survive. Them. Between them? I mean, I'd say I'm pretty experienced coming from Philippines. Um, <laughs> what do you mean? No, I mean, coming from Philippines, you, I've actually had to survive a lot of things like when I was younger um, because we, we weren't very well off. Like I came from a very middle-class family and, you know, at times when I, I'm not, I'm, and I'm being serious about this, um, when we couldn't really, you know, afford like good food, we'd just, you know, eat from what we call like karinderia, like, mm -hmm. like street food and everything. And, and it's, it's very true, like coming from Philippines where you don't usually have the most luxurious things in life. I had experienced a lot of things growing up. So yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> I'm glad you clarified because I thought you were suggesting there was a lot of zombies that we didn't know about. No, <laughs> no zombies. <laughs> Chloe, okay, do yeah. you have any counter attacks? Like, like what? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm probably the most, what, the least forgetful person here. Let's be honest. Yeah. Um, and I'm, for, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a neat freak, and I like everything in a line, and so. Zombies might make that a bit difficult, Chloe, to be honest. Yeah. So, I'm not sure how I'd fare with zombies, <laughs> but I know that I'm a very organized person, and I wouldn't forget anything. <laughs> I, I couldn't can... do it. I don't think she would be able because she's scared and, of but, the, oh, she's scared of like spiders and that's stuff. That's what I mean. Like she... from the Philippines, you know, like we see cockroaches every yeah, year. I think yeah, she would be the best. I think she would be the best out of here because she like Lost she comes night, from the Philippines. We were, in, we were in the hotel room and we were, we were stuck <laughs> with a bug for an hour and we were so scared. Me, she, though. she left. And I was in the dark and it blew onto my phone and I basically, I basically cried because I could, <laughs> I'm so scared. Oh my God. I do not, I just, I, um, I do not involve I myself don't. in this chaotic energy. <laughs> <laughs> I disassociate myself. <laughs> what an answer. Well, it sounds to me like Southeast Asian living is the way to go. And as somebody currently in Malaysia, I fully support this. And I shan't speak of me screaming very dramatically when I went to islands <laughs> recently because it's a spider the size of your hand. And I'm not joking. Oh, so if you can deal with that and you're used to it, Bianca, I'm sure. I don't think any could. of my teammates would survive in Southeast Asia. <laughs> yeah, that's Sing Singapore I, I probably. Australia. To be fair, I went to I went to Bali mm -hmm. and I struggled a bit because yeah yeah like there's a lot of insects bugs like also it's very different so i think it's normal yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't yes. handle barley zombies may be a bit of a problem um let's try fire on because there's a lot of questions like i said although that was a terrific answer journey via youtube wants to know for bianca and chloe what's the biggest thing you've learned since joining prema bianca why don't you go first um, that's all I, it's hard to narrow down like one specific but um I think it's actually holding yourself um like high and most mm -hmm. of times you know um actually this is one thing that um I learned when I first drove from uh in the race in F4 UAE and I had my team manager Goofy Piro and um I've never done an F4 race or um a race that's like super like high professional there was like 40 drivers in the grid and it was insane. And I was just like, you know, what? like Chloe felt I wasn't used to the whole like race yet to the whole um, procedure and everything. And he actually, you know, told me that um, whether you're a rookie or not, you're a rookie of Prema. And that itself is already a higher standard than everyone else around you. And I quote, I quote him. And and I think that is one of the best things, one of the best um, words of wisdom I've gotten from anyone else, because, you know, um, I think when you're in the fa in the Prema family, you're not just, you know, representing yourself, but representing the history and uh, the everything behind Prema, you know, of how high performance they are. So everything that you do on track and off track, you got to think of not just yourself, but everyone you're associated with. So I think that, you know, allowed me to take myself accountable for a lot of things and be professional, be disciplined and overall help myself become a better driver hmm. 
I really like that. And we've obviously seen in F2, Fred Vesti return to the fold and do go so well. So starting a good relationship. You were asked this one as well, Chloe. Have you learned anything particular, the biggest thing you've learned since joining? I mean, that's a big question for me because I've been with Prema basically <laughs> since the start of my career, you could say. Mm. So I think they basically taught me everything from ground zero. But I I think the, the main things that I've learned is what Bianca said is how how to to treat your work, how, how your work ethic is, how to um, you know, understand the car. I think Prem has taught me a lot about the engineering side of the car, not just the racing. And it really helps helps me um, you know, changes the way I work so that I can approach a track in the right way and and use use my brain a bit more rather than than just going on the track and saying oh yeah let's discover the track because no. <laughs> oh yeah let's well as a beginner that's what I do yeah. and and so they've given me some some really useful tools to just know exactly what to do in which situation um when starting on a new track and that's really useful for someone like me and then also with the work ethic side of things it's you know, we have a lot of time for them to to talk to us, and they they really like really want us to to improve. And I can feel that um their passion towards the sport is really important towards driver development. So, um, they make me passionate about being fast, and mm. that's a really important thing to have in the team as well as my teammates as well, which which are really important to me because um they they help me quite a bit. It sounded a little bit like an afterthought, Chloe, but I won't push you too much. Just bringing them up at the end. I'm joking. I'm joking. But loads of questions. Like I said, this one's from Harry Benjamin, the F1 Academy commentator who was talking over you guys. This one's to Marta. I noticed Marta Garcia had the Mercedes badge in her helmet. Is she affiliated in some way? Yeah. Yeah. So one of my main sponsors for this year is Mercedes Ben Valdisa, which mm. is a group in Valencia. It's like a confessionary, a group, a big group, big group in Valencia of Mercedes. So that's why I'm wearing like the Mercedes um, badge in the front. And then I'm wearing like AMG because it's like more AMG cars. And Valdisa, which is the group. If you if you see the helmet, you can see like properly Valdisa and then the Mercedes and then AMG. So that's why I'm wearing this. It's not like I like Mercedes or whatever. <laughs> but yeah. So we can confirm that you are replacing Lewis Hamilton next year. That's a good exclusive for us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jake Sanson, who is a feeder series karting editor. Ah. To, to Bianca, I thought you might know this. To oh, Bianca. I miss you, Jake. Oh, I miss you, Jake. Yeah, he's a great guy. He wants to know how much stronger you are now than you were a, a year ago, mentally and physically. Oh, that's a, that's a tough question because I've, I've known Jake since 2017 when I first saw him in a kart race in Asia. And so he has really been following me growing up in motorsport and he knows the struggle. You know, I, I think mentally I've always been offset compared to others around me because of the pressure that I've always just given myself because, you know, I'm coming from Philippines where I, you know, where I did, like I said earlier, um, we never had financial, you know, um, we never had, stability to even pursue such a sport like this even just getting food on the table was hard and and that's why every race for me was a struggle you know to get a car to get the entry fee this and that that's why coming into uh, formula cars and driving with prema was the biggest dream that i never knew was even possible at first and so mentally I've always just held myself so accountable for every mistakes I've done, which I think kind of ate me up a little um, because I knew that it wasn't given a silver platter that I had to work hard for everything, you know, through my media. Um, I, I've always had to um, to share all my struggles because it, it's true. And I think as well, you know, being so young and having to deal with a lot of pressure, it's mentally taxing and you know worrying if you're saying the right words if i'm doing the right things and this and that and just constantly overthinking and then you know not even just thinking about the performance side but this is everything outside of motorsport that not many people get to see and you know that's actually what i've been trying to do best you know with the big um, platform i have is to actually show the other side of motorsport and how we racing drivers mentally struggle as well um 
And, you know, physically as well, with the support I've gotten this year, I was able to actually, you know, get the funding, get the sponsor and be able to train with um, the professional teams like 321 Perform, um, where Esteban Akon is actually training as well. And, and you know, through that, I was able to, to train with my idols that inspires me so much and actually, you know, do the same workouts, the same routine mentally and physically. And I think um, for, for, for a driver that's developing, that's one of the key important bits is to actually have the right people surrounding you, the right environment. And, you know, you know, where you, you, you can't grow from the same environment. And, and that's why I'm so thankful for what I have now to be with Prema and to train in three, two, one, because it has been such an important factor to my performance. I can really tell the confidence that's coming out of your voice compared to you were not you were unconfident last year when I saw you in any interviews. But no, I, I I definitely wasn't because um like I said um coming from Philippines I w- there was a lot of um culture differences I would mm. say so I was just really culture shock last year you know when I. You know, I grew up watching Formula One, never expecting I'd even come to Europe. I came to Europe for the first time last year and I got here and it was so different. And and so I just didn't have the confidence. And mm. that's one thing I realized is that motorsport requires pretty much 90% confidence. And if you don't have it, you're not able to perform well. So that's something I've been working on. <laughs> uh, it's, it's coming through. It's coming through. This question's uh, lovely. I've just got to try and whiz through. Love the answer. I love the answer. Nida <laughs> via Discord for Chloe. This was your first full race, full race weekend in single seaters. How have you found the transition between karting and the F1 Academy machinery? They ask both from a driving perspective and an engineering perspective, but I'm genuinely more interested in the engineering side, Chloe. How much access did you have in karting to what you've got now? So, so karting's quite simplistic. You don't have, um, you you don't have uh, the gear stuff to worry about. You don't need to worry about the the engine cooling perspective, and um, I think the the biggest engineering difference between karting and cars is like it's a lot bigger and everything matters a lot more. So, so if, if your, if your engine's just a little bit off, you lose like what, half a second, maybe down the straight. And, and that's a big deal. Like in karting, you maybe lose like half attempts. So it's not a massive deal. Um, so I think that's, that's the main engineering difference. Obviously I can't say that much just because like, I'm not, I'm not an engineer myself, but I know that there's a lot with the, the caster and the camber that, that makes a big difference in the cars and, um, I'll move on to the driving bit before before I make a mistake because I don't know that much. But the driving's a lot different. Again, I say say everything matters a lot more. How you're braking, the brake shape, like in karting, you can brake in it's either a trail brake or is a sharp brake. And in cars, you you have, sometimes you come off and you go back on, and um, so that's a big difference. Is and everything's a lot slower as well. So mm-hmm. when you're driving a car, you can be quite like smooth and you go like that but in cars you really have to be patient and it feels like, like every corner is taking forever um but that's how you drive fast so you've got to deal with being patient and yes it was a big transition I think my first two de- test days in the car was was quite hard in Monza um where I was just trying to to get used to everything as much as I can but I think the first official test in Barcelona is where I really started to to get a little bit more confidence. It's, it's still not there. Like I, um, I still don't have full confidence with the car, which is holding me back a bit. But I think that the teams really helped me build that confidence and build the knowledge around the car and just adjust really well. So going into the first race weekend, I felt really good. And the test day showed it all. <laughs> well hopefully it'll continue improving can't wait to see how far you go good few questions i'm trying to go and whiz through here this one's from molly and specifically i don't know why but marta do you like pineapples on pizza no <laughs> no you look, you look disgusted <laughs> if no. you're not if you're not watching we had marta putting an x symbol with her fingers there very much a big no um you touched on this a second ago bianca where's mansbridge wants to know bianca can you talk us through the moment you found out esteban ocon's admiration for you and have you spoken to as they say esty bestie since <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's the you 
an amazing person. That's honestly like, uh, they always say never meet your idols, but I think I was glad that I met, uh, you know, one of my idols because he really was an amazing person. Like when I first saw him in the center, I was just like, just like, just like <laughs> admiring from afar, just holding myself back because, you know, like you always have to have a mentality that your colleagues, you know, even, you, even though he's in Formula One, you got to treat him like, you know, he's just a driver. We're just training together and that's it. But, you know, I really couldn't help it. And, but, you know, you know, when we were working out together, I was just trying my best to like, like keep up. Like, you know, I was like, I was asking, um, oh, how much weight that um, Esteban did during the neck workout doing this? And he was like, and my coach was like, you're 10 kgs away. Okay. <laughs> and then I was just like, no way. And, but yeah, I think it's, it's really like so funny because I'm, um, you know, like, having like this standard and knowing how far off you are from, from achieving your goals, you know, I think physically is, is um what the main difference why F1 is so phys- like so dif- um, difficult. And so be able to train with him was so cool. And not only that was that he was such a great like personality um, during lunch, we'd, we'd, we'd eat together and, you know, speak and talk. And um, he would ask me, you know, how my journey was. And actually, you know, I had a quite lengthy conversation with him talking to him about, how actually difficult it was coming from Philippines and how my situation is now and and how much I've progressed a lot. And, you know, he was just very conversationalist. Um, and he gave me advice and tips, you know, as an as a, an, an ex-Prema driver as well. He spent most of his times, you know, training here, working with the same people and, you know, living at, at the same village even. So he was, um, it was a very relatable conversation with him. And, and so like, when the live stream happened, like I got like 50 messages of just random people telling me that Esteban was talking about you. And I wasn't really <laughs> it. Uh, but, but yeah, it's um a, a, a great um a great like um acknowledgement to receive, especially in your junior formula days, um, from a very well experienced driver like him. So I think that that really um set my confidence up quite a bit. <laughs> I can imagine. And I've seen a rival podcast in the feed series from Marcus Armstrong with Callum Eilert talking all sorts about Prima food and all this sort of stuff in the village and everything. So I'm sure you had loads of tips. Now, I know you guys are going to have to rush off soon. So I'm going to try and whiz through some potentially one word answers. I know that can always be difficult with drivers. This one's to Marta from Stein, MS34 Supremacy via Discord. Which series do you keep up with as a racing driver? I'm going to say Formula One is an obvious answer so is there any other series that you keep up with um obviously f2 f3 and uh, to be fair right now i'm not watching anything because i'm just really focused on racing that i'm like i don't have time to watch anything i even didn't see the racing did you see the the f1 race i did you when did, you, when did you see the F1 race? Oh, yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah, yesterday, yeah. yesterday was the race and we were yeah. racing. So. Yeah, but I was having a chill day, you know, yeah. like I just don't need like chill a bit because it was, yeah, head it was like... quite eventful actually. Um, yeah, just speaking about Esteban, what happened during the race, I think that was um like a crazy, a crazy thing. What happened? Um, <laughs> I, don't I haven't seen, so I don't know. Um, during the pit lane, um, there was a peep, there were some people in there as he was coming into the pits and photographers photographers and he almost oh, ran him no. over because um they were blocking the pit lane so i think um yeah that's one crazy thing especially you know with the safety and everything but yeah uh marta let me just say i know these are one more dancers but just watch the highlights of this race it was not one no i'm gonna <laughs> watch i will watch the i will watch the highlights okay. watch <laughs> youtube yeah. five minute highlights is more than enough and i don't know how they even yeah. got five minutes of highlights out of this one um Chloe, if you have one, what is your pre-race ritual for luck? Jazz music. <laughs> Jazz music for the both yeah. of us. She comes into the truck and she just plays like piano. It is or... like we're, we're more. I think we're more like nervous. We get like, or like the... more like than Bianca. So we need to chill a bit more. In <laughs> terms I'm, of... I'm always just like this. Yeah. You mean like this? Like I'm always just like like she, ready. Have you seen her jump? Like she like jumps up and down before she gets in the car yeah. and like does the whole like thing. I can't. Well, maybe you do that to release the stress. No, like, to like energize myself. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're I don't need opposite. to energize. We, I need to relax. 
And we like we have like little like sleeping mats underneath our driver tables, and I'm listening. just like doing laps around the truck while you guys sleep. <laughs> jazz music. And yeah, she chill. she actually showed me the jazz thing because I was not into it, and um, and then she was like, oh yeah, like you know, like I listen to this like this songs on like this playlist of jazz, and then uh, it's quite relaxing to be for like it's quite chill. Before I, the race. I do enjoy some jazz. Uh, this was from Banana via Discord, I should add as well. So good answer. Um, this one, this one, this one, this one was, oh, to Bianca. If This is from Dan, Boshong and the Lacey Stan. If you could choose your number in F1 Academy, what would you pick and why? <laughs> I know which no, one. Wait, 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 wait. wait let me, okay, so <laughs> yeah. Two. Um, no, I think I've actually grown fond of number 16. I, I think um, it's quite a good number, actually, because when you invert it, it's number nine, the six. And actually, me and Mars are, are I would say Mars is my biggest competitor on and off track because we're even fighting for the same car number. Um, so I like, I've always ran the number 119 back in karting when you can use like three digit numbers. But as I moved up, you can only use two and stuff. So I've always just kept 19 because it's my birthday, January 19th. Okay. So one line. And um, I remember when I first met Marta last year, when she had the car number 19 in W Series, I remember coming up to her and saying, hey, you have I, my number. Can I have your number? Like, <laughs> no, I your car number. number. <laughs> and then she showed me a tattoo of like, number 19. No? <laughs> and so I was like, okay, you can have it. You win. <laughs> yes, I'd, I'd get the number 19 if I, if I could. Maybe I'll fight for it with Marta. Yeah. <laughs> one, one day when the grid grows and everything last few bits and this is the feed uh part of the podcast uh where we dive into food this question well there's two questions here but i'm gonna go for the one from cm parfait 16 because this is one actually quite interesting let's go as i look at you right to left so we're going bianca marta Chloe. Okay. yeah <laughs> oh, so right. just conf- yeah you guys will be confused what i can see um yeah. recommend to us recommend each one of you your country's best meal okay um so i go first um in philippines um we have a lot of fried food um we have a lot of seafoods um i think asian in general and a lot of rice if there's one thing i could actually suggest is um sisig sinigam adobo and um and lechon can you briefly describe what that is? Because I don't think any of us, <laughs> looking at Chloe in particular. <laughs> so um, sisig is actually a bunch of, um, it's pork, it's a bit of other meats and egg and um, onions and stuff that's like sizzled together and it's served in a sizzling plate. Mm. And it's very, very good. Philippines are very known oh, for a lot of sizzling things. Yeah, you're making me really I'm hungry. It's time to eat. <laughs> it's time to eat. And, so, like um, and um, we have um, sinigang, which is like a broth soup with, um, you can either have um, beef or you can have shrimp in it. And it's so, so good. Um, but yeah, I think that's the two things that I would suggest. Marta? Um, for me, I think, uh, well, there is a lot of food in Valencia, actually, that I could recommend. Actually, I love Spain. In Valencia, sorry, well, in Spain. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, like, more focused on Valencia because we have, like, paella, mm-hmm. you know, like, paella. We have also course, arroz al horno. Yeah, we have also arroz al horno, which is, like, rice in the in the oven, you mm-hmm. know, and it's really good. It's really, really good. And we also have patat- eh, tortilla de patatas, mm-hmm. like, omelette, potato, and stuff. It's really good as well with the uh, onion and croquetas, croquetas, mm-hmm. the jamón, jamón ibérico, jamón ibérico. Oh my God. <laughs> I tried that when we went I to want the house jamón ibérico now. Uh, and also patatas bravas. I think that would be like what you need to try if you go to Spain. Well, they said best meal. I think I have about half a menu from you there, Marta, but you'll be it's going. It's actually a bit soon. funny because um, a bit of the Spanish food um, we have the same in Philippines. Oh, like um, we just call it in a different way, like empanadas. Oh, because um a bit of that's our decision no but um we have it similar to like the croc ah the croqueta yeah croqueta yeah i don't know what that's talking about it's really good, <laughs> really good. Yeah, you'll, you'll find out in a week you'll give me over in the I, no actually no, tomorrow. Tomorrow. you'll find out tomorrow. tomorrow tomorrow she's probably staying at my house perfect there you go you can what? guys stay at my house yeah <laughs> I, I know you this is embarrassing have... to ask you last on this call, especially with the difference. But 
favorite meal, best meal that you recommend? Me? Mm -hmm. Which country oh, no. do you want? Well, you which one? <laughs> oh no, I, I can do one from each country if you want. Go, why not? Go on, go on. China? No, England. it's your country. Canada, no, UK. Ah, but, but I can't say much about the UK. Yeah, no, that, that's why I was worried for the license part. Um, chicken curry, <laughs> fish and chips. No, but I don't like fish and chips really. Butter chicken, <laughs> but that's Indian, right? So British UK, Indian. If we if we go like UK UK, mm -hmm. then probably a good Sunday roast. Oh okay, yeah, that's I good. agree. Yeah, go yeah. no wrong. Yeah, good good. Sunday <laughs> roast. That's good. But I, I I need to do Canada and China now because UK is just disappointing to be fair. Wow. <laughs> Lost all the UK fans <laughs> right there. <laughs> Canada would be would be poutine just because like it's a bit of a cheap food and it's it's nice and it tastes good. And then China would be Ho Fun. I don't know uh -huh. if I'm saying it right, but it's like it's like flat rice noodles mm -hmm. in like um black bean sauce, mm. vegetables. Some sometimes you have like meat, so I like beef Ho Fun, and it's just. My mum makes it all the time at home for dinner, and I, um, and she she likes to tell us stories about her culture in in China. So it's 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 kind of like a a, a very homey meal, and it feels quite close to the heart. So, um, that would be my favorite meal overall. I think if you three opened a restaurant, I would be there every night because between the lot of that, oh, we the call meals, it. You oh. must have no <laughs> the free prey yeah. Matias. um there's a question here from shy and i'll try and whisper these ones so if you can one word it'd be great but i've already noticed that you you lot might not be the best like at the one word answers. it's okay mm -hmm. you you the ones to put the hard, the hard time limit on and I, I, i've just asked the questions shy by discord what's your favorite post race meal and why don't we do the same order again oh no yeah. why am i always first it's not yeah, fair <laughs> Um, I like doing a... the thing where it's like churning. <laughs> I'm hungry. I am um, do. Come on, guys. <laughs> focus, focus. Yeah, but you're going first. Yeah, go yeah. Just say go something. I can't focus if you guys are just say something. <laughs> Whatever. This. Um, Potatoes. You stepped out the car, yeah. you got P2, and you wanted to eat. I don't really know what to do. I guess I need a lot of time. She she rocks up to dinner. She orders oysters and chips. That's not a meal. <laughs> <laughs> oysters are good for you. It gives you testosterone. And the chips, they're good for you. Um, sometimes roasted, but <laughs> actually, um, if I want to race, I'd get a chocolate chip cookie. Oh, good answer. Good answer. Yeah. Sushi. Ah, yeah. Sushi. 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 Sushi yesterday, actually. Yeah. Like, we walked across the highway to get to the <laughs> That's how important it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is from Matu's Fret 98. What's your favorite menu, I guess, meal from McDonald's? Not that you guys ah, have ever been, of course. A spicy chicken sandwich. A what? A spicy chicken sandwich. Okay, good answer. And one word answer almost. They're very good. Marta, have you ever been to McDonald's? What would you choose? My McFlurry. <laughs> no, to be fair. No. Oh, what's wrong Normally, with when I go when I go to McDonald's, I never order like food. I just in case that it's it's like super late and I have to go to a McDonald's and then get food. But mm -hmm. always I go for the McFlurry, like Oreo McFlurry. Mm -hmm. If not, I just get like a hamburger with cheese and some stuff. But I don't even know the name. So cheeseburger. No, no, no. Like, it's another one, but it's quite similar. Roman Belinsky, who was on and asked the question, who was on last week, asked you the question, says he gets a cheeseburger when he's in Italy without the cheese because they don't understand just a burger. So, uh, yeah, exactly. That was my reaction as well. Chloe, what's your favourite menu slash meal from McDonald's? The thing is, when I go to McDonald's, I don't get the same thing every time. Yeah. Like, it's either chicken nuggets, mm -hmm. a hamburger, or like a Big Mac or something like that, or a wrap. But like my 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 go my go to wrap is like the the crispy chicken, chicken with the, yeah. the sweet chili sauce. Okay, now I'm hungry. Yeah, yeah. Can we please go eat? <laughs> two more questions and they're kind of the same. So no, Michael Boyodis, two I'm more so questions. Hungry. You do this. You could do this. Michael Boyodis wants to know what's your favorite type of cheese, and Ashley wants to know what your least favorite type of cheese is. These are important well, questions. We don't have a lot of cheese. Do you want to skip this one, Bianca? Um. I don't really know. Queso de bola. Queso de bola. What? Queso de bola. Yeah, it's a what cheese in the Philippines. 
Casa de Bola. It sounds very Spanish. Like Spanish. It is. Casa de Bola. Yeah. What does Bola it's... mean? Like a the, bowl. Like a, a bowl. A cheese bowl. bowl. Casa de Bola. Okay. Not familiar okay. with it. Kind Close of cheese. Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> let me think. <laughs> you go first. Uh, it's one of two. It's either Actually. Brie or <laughs> Buffalo Mozzarella. Are you going for the favorite one here or the least favorite? Both favorite. Okay. Do you have a least favorite, Chloe? Anything that's really like hard and like yeah. mm -hmm. rocket for? Do you like rocket for? Like the hard, like strong stuff. I don't know. I just say par like Parmesan? No, Parmesan is good. Yeah. yeah. Just, uh, parmesan is really good for a pasta. But it's like say anything that tastes a bit like exotic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anything that's um anything that's not too fresh anymore. That's like it's been there but for like the a year. Like, like stuff that's aged that's good, like goat cheese is quite nice actually. Like I've tried that. Goat cheese. Goat goat cheese. Okay guys, focus. I'm mean, like cheddar Marta. cheese, yeah. You know my like, cheddar cheese, cheese is good before. With, yeah. With chips. Okay, Marta. Go with the burger. Right, your thumb. Yeah, for me, I don't know. To be fair, I, I like I, I think I like all of the cheese. Cheeses? Cheeses. <laughs> Cheeses. Cheeses. I really enjoy here in Italy uh, mozzarella mm -hmm. or bufala. Mm -hmm. which is really really good and um i think cheddar like typical cheese you know for like burgers and stuff well you like it yeah i like it <laughs> and i probably don't like to eat like and like on a sauce yeah rocky for sauce mm -hmm. but to eat rocky for just like this yeah i don't like it i completely understand and i'm gonna let you guys go because how terrible of me to force you to talk about food right before lunchtime in Italy of all places as well so I was doing well until we started talking about yeah <laughs> I'll bear in mind next time always at the end before people want to run away so I gonna say that's all the time we have this week thank you to everybody for watching and listening thank you to all three of you for coming on if you'd like to have your question asked on a future episode use the hashtag askfs on twitter Drop any questions below. If you're watching on YouTube, you can respond to our Instagram stories or posts or let us know what questions you have on your mind on our Discord. Look for the podcast questions channel. And if you are watching on YouTube, dropping a like on the video, leaving a comment and subscribing to the channel all really helps us out. And if you are listening, leaving a review on the podcast platform you're listening on is greatly appreciated. Finally, check out feederseries.net for more feeder series insight and follow feeder underscore series, FS Americas and feeder series now on Twitter. You can find the links to all of those, plus the Twitter accounts for myself and everyone else on the podcast in the YouTube description or the podcast show notes. Until next time, we've been the Feeder Series podcast. Goodbye.